Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that there is much we need to learn. We need your instruction. We ask, Lord, that we can learn in the school of Christ, of his meekness and his lowliness, and that we can reflect your character to all around us. We ask for your Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins, and strengthen us, and correct us. And we pray for each person, for the people that we have contact with as well. We just ask that um, you can bless each one. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so yesterday we had finished off the line of the chronology of Esther. Um, and we had talked about how Esther 1, 2, and 3 parallel Daniel 1, 2, and 3. And so we're going to look at Daniel 1, 2, and 3. That is, the idea is that the first angel's message is Daniel chapter 1, the second angel's message is Daniel chapter 2, and the third angel's message is Daniel chapter 3. Um, and so we're going to look at that a little bit. Um, I also want to look at some of the chronology here, because um, these are things that often I never touch on. They're things I've studied in the past um, that actually help establish uh, the chronology of the book of Daniel and the 70 year periods. Um, we're going to look at some of the, the numbers here um, in especially Daniel chapter three. But we're going to look at this also in Daniel chapter one and two. Um, so I've kind of gone through this on my own a little bit. Um, so I have some ideas. Obviously, we're going to notice more things as we go through it. So, uh, so I welcome everyone uh, to this study. And, um, and I think this will be enlightening and it will help us in placing that context of, of the study that Colin had presented dealing with Daniel 3. Uh, Daniel <clears throat> chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, and uh, connecting that to Revelation 17. <clears throat> so the first thing we know about the book of Daniel is um, that it, Daniel's going to be taken captive. This is the siege of Jerusalem. It's not a very long siege, um, uh, but this siege occurs, and we have placed it in the fall of 607 BC. Now, where do most people place the captivity of Daniel? Where do they place the third year of Jehoiakim? Does anybody know? Or people are going to look at the 70 years. Where, we're going to start it in the fall of 607. Where do most people start it? Wouldn't they start it in the spring? Okay, well... No, it's not so much that it's in the spring, though usually sieges occur in the spring. Um, but most most scholars would place this in uh, 605, 604. So that is, they're going to place it probably more likely in 604 BC. Now, of course, what's the problem in having the 70 years begin in 604? That would mean that Babylon would have to have been overthrown in 534. Well, uh, the 70 years for Babylon would still be from 609 to 539. All right. Right. So it wouldn't affect that, but it would affect the 70 years um, for the land, right? The 70 years captivity, because there's the 70 years at Babylon. And if those don't start until 604 and the Israelites return in 536, that's only 68 years. So if we're going to have the 70 years captivity uh, beginning in uh, 604, obviously it's not going to work. Um, now, when we look at this, though, we, we know that the third year of Jehoiakim is actually from the fall of 607 to the fall of 606. And, and what they try to say is, well, this third year of 
of Jehoiakim is really the fourth year of Jehoiakim, and they have all kinds of maneuverings that they do, but it creates all kinds of contradictions, and nobody can agree on anything. But if we just take simply that the third year of Jehoiakim goes fall to fall, um, and I'm going to show you here. Um, <clears throat> So what I have here is just this chart laying out uh, this chronology. And you have the fall of Assyria in 609. That's going to be the end of Josiah's reign. Um, and uh, uh, beginning of Jehoiakim's um, is going to happen in 609. Of course, we know that there's Jehoahaz there for three months, but, but they're both going to be in 609. Um, so... And then Jehoiakim's first year is going to begin in the fall of 609. And then his second year is the fall of 608. His third year is in the fall of 607. You can see that's fall to fall. And Daniel's going to be taken captive. The first Hebrew captives are taken. That's the wild beast robbing them of their children. That's going to be the fall of 607. So sometime after the beginning of the seventh month. It could be the eighth month or the ninth month. We don't know exactly when, maybe even in the seventh month. And then we have um, Nabopolassar is still the king of Babylon, and he's going to die um, in 605, right? So Nebuchadnezzar, when he takes Daniel captive, is not the king of Babylon at that time. He's referred to the, as the king of Babylon in Daniel chapter 1. So when we look at this, we'll see that. But he, he's the crown prince. But he later does become the king of Babylon. So he's referred to as the king of Babylon prole proleptically. I think that's how you say that. What you mean? Just means after the fact. So just you're taking, it's like if you called uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, President Trump, but you were referring to him, something that happened to President Trump before he was president. Right? So... He wasn't President Trump, you know, when he was in his 30s, but you could say, well, President Trump in his 30s. Well, obviously, he wasn't President Trump in his 30s, right? Mm -hmm. So so that's all that's happening there. And um, now Nebuchadnezzar uh, becomes king, obviously, after his father dies. And um, after the Battle of Carchemish, he's going to quickly go back to Babylon and uh, and take the throne, right? So that's going to be in 605. Now, the Babylonian Chronicles doesn't mention anything about Nebuchadnezzar's army in the fall of 607. So we don't know what his army is doing then, but the idea is that that's when he goes to Jerusalem. Now, so if Daniel's taken captive at the in the fall of 607, we know that there is this three years that they have to uh, study, right? And then at the end of the days, they're going to be examined. So if Daniel was taken captive in uh, 60, uh, 604, early in 604, uh, his exam would have to be when? <clears throat> when was his, his exam occur? Wouldn't the exam have had to have occurred in six, um, 601, right? Okay. Right? And, and 601, we don't see it on here, but we can see the second year of Nebuchadnezzar is from 603 to 602, from the spring of 603 to the spring of 602. So it's difficult to fit um, Daniel's exam in the chronology of, um, you know, that, well, that the Babylonian captivity beginning in 604. Okay. Now, the, the problem, the reason I was, I was kind of stuttering there is right. we're having to remember that these years – proceed in a, a different order than what we're used to seeing them proceed. Right. Yeah. So they're going backwards BC, right? Right. Back. So I know it, it's, 
I'm, I'm very used to it because I do this all the time, but yeah. So, but we can see here then, so 607 to 604, we can put Daniel's exam um, probably, and, and the way, the place that I would place it, I put it here, you know, sort of halfway through three years. But I, I don't think that it necessarily had to be three complete years, but it definitely needed to be, um, you know, a lot more than just two years or a year and a half or something like that. Because, you know, it talks about at the end of the days, as we're going to see. And, you know, it is possible that Daniel's exam is going to occur in uh, the spring of 604 rather than the fall of 604 in connection with Nebuchadnezzar's um, uh, coronation. That, that is possible. So, you know, so you could move it to like two and a half years. Um, but if you had, you know, 604, that is, you're going to have it happen at the beginning of Nebuchadnezzar's first full year. We know that Daniel chapter two is going to happen in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar and that Daniel is already. Um, he's not just some captive. He's actually one of the, you know, Chaldeans, right? He's one of the, the the people that has been set up as an administrator. So he always, already has his role. If he was just a student in the second full year, um, there would be no reason for him to be able to go to Nebuchadnezzar and make this plea uh, to give him time to find out uh, to you know what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was and the interpretation of it, right? So you know if you you have like a year later, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and we already have Daniel chapter one that this exam has already happened. It, it definitely doesn't fit, right? So these are some of the problems that people have when they're trying to follow modern scholarship. Modern scholarship, uh, the, the problem that they have is they will say, well, there's no evidence that Daniel was taken captive in the fall of 607 because the Babylonian Chronicles doesn't mention it. But there's no reason that it would mention it. Right. You know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Now, if we had Nebuchadnezzar's army doing something else at that time, then we would say, well, it couldn't have happened then because we would know Nebuchadnezzar's army is doing something else. But it doesn't say anything about what his army is doing. And, and as the crown prince, he had his own army, as we find out in the Babylonian Chronicles. And it's only mentioned when his army is working with his dad um, that they're going to mention it. Or after he takes over his dad's army when his dad is sick. So because the Babylonian Chronicles are basically just take, keeping track of astronomical events and military events in relationship to the king of Babylon. Um, so they would have no interest in what the crown prince is doing unless it's connected with his father. So, so that's why we have room there for Daniel's captivity to happen in 607. Now, traditionally, um, uh, Adventists had the view, and, and this would be, you know, pretty common, is that the third year of Jehoiakim is 606, right? As you can see there. It, it spans from the fall of 607 to 606. And so people would just generally say Daniel's captivity happened in 606. Right. So. And, and then they would have this night neat thing, you know, they'd have it in the spring of 606 and then they'd have 536, 70 years later. But Ellen White's quite clear that the 70 years are completed in the fall of 530 or 637 when um see cyrus comes to the throne so she has the 70 years complete six months prior to the issuing of the decree so there are are things there that ellen white notices that you know the pioneers never noticed and definitely scholars never noticed okay so just wanted to clear up that that chronology there and we're going to look at uh, daniel chapter one and a few other things in this chapter that are of importance. <clears throat> I 
Of course, Daniel chapter one is going to begin the 70 years. Um, you know, if we're going to say this is the first angel's message, um, you normally when you have you have it as a line, you would have a period of darkness, you'd have an arrival of the message, right, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if we necessarily need to draw it out as a line. But the one thing that we know is that Daniel chapter 3 definitely is the Sunday law. And the Sunday law is dealing with the third angel's message, right? The issue of Sabbath Sunday. So when you go to Daniel chapter 3, you have all of these symbols. We have uh, this image. And if Stephen was here, he could tell us more about it. Maybe Iran knows some of the things about the measurement. Um, but I know Stephen has done some specific measurements dealing with this image. Um, the obvious thing, of course, is it's three score cubits in height. So that's 60 cubits tall and uh, six cubits in breadth. And six times 60 is 360. So it has this, this symbol attached to it. Um, there's other ways, too, in which we can give this the number 666. I can't remember how people do that. Um, and uh, we're going to have, um, no, there's uh, Daniel, you know, Mishael, Hananiah, Hananiah, and Azariah are these four Hebrew captives, Daniel and his three friends. But in this story, it's just going to be the latter three. So and they, they have their names changed. Um, uh, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Hananiah is names changed to Shadrach, Meshach is names changed, or Mishael's names changed to Meshach, and Azariah's names changed to Abednego, right? So they're going to have these uh, three Hebrews that are not going to bow down to this golden image. So they're going to stand there at the Sunday law. And we're going to look at this a little bit more and try to see what that but some of the symbols that are here. Um, but before we go there, let's go back to chapter one. So in chapter one, um, if we were going to take this as a line, we would have to take this. Uh, uh, there isn't a time of the end attached to this 70 years, but there is a previous 70 years that ended, right? So from 607, when um, Manasseh is taken captive to Daniel being taken captive is 70 years. So can we say that this is then the 70 years that precedes the time of the end in this line? That should be possible. Right. So it's it's a 70 years period of probation in which they have to reform. And if you're not reformed by these things, then wild beasts shall rob you of your children. Right. So they're not reformed. And now Manasseh did a work of reform. Um, and that work of reform was undone by his son. Um, um, what's his son's name? Just trying to think of it. Uh, some reason escapes my mind. Who comes after Manasseh? It's, uh, I can't think of his name. It'll come back to me when I'm not thinking of it. And then, and then you're going to have Josiah, right? So Josiah is going to do this period of reform. Uh, but he's going to disobey God. He's going to go to war against the Egypt. Ammon, right? Yeah, thanks, Angela. Yeah, it's Ammon. And I knew it had something to do with, like, the name is similar to the Am, you know, to sun worship or something like the Ammonites. But yeah, Ammon, but it's not related. Okay, so, so you got Manasseh, Ammon, then you have Josiah. And Josiah is going to be killed in 609 in that battle that uh, between... Assyria and Egypt. He's going to go to fight against Egypt. Stray arrow is going to hit him. He's going to die. And that's going to be two years before Daniel's taken captive. And um, after Josiah dies, right, of course, there's going to be 
um, his son that's going to be made king, and that's going to be not Jehoiakim, but first uh, Jehoahaz, and then for three months, and then Jehoiakim, right? And then Jehoiakim is, is made king in 609, and then it's going to be in the third year of Jehoiakim that Daniel's taken captive at the beginning of the third year of Jehoiakim. <clears throat> okay, so, so we're going to have uh, that 70 years ending in the third year of Jehoiakim, the 70 years period of probation. And then... When Daniel's taken captive, he's carried to Babylon, along with other Hebrew captives. And he has three friends. So these are, um, we're gonna look at these, right? So these are going to be uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now their names are going to be changed. So I'm going to go to this chart here. Right, I made a little chart this morning dealing with their names. Is. <clears throat> okay, so we have we have their names in Hebrew, and then I did the gematria of their names, and then the strong numbers. So you can see Daniel is eighteen forty, Hananiah's two six zero eight, Mishael's four three three two, and Azariah's five eight three eight. And so there's some interesting things. First, it's going to be Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah whose names are going to be changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are going to be thrown before the fire into the fiery furnace. Now, the gematria of their three names in Hebrew adds up to 187. So that's why I have that highlighted in that way. I'm adding 56 plus 67 plus 64, and that gives me 187. So is that significant? It's interesting. Okay. Now, um, and then I had added up the strong numbers for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And I, I come to this number, 14618. Now, if we remember when we were studying the wave offering, and we counted from the 16th day of the second month when the manna first began, to the 16th day of the first month, 40 years later, when they went out to gather the manna and there was no manna, that went from... Uh, the 16th day of the, of the second month to the 16th day of the first month, both of which are going to be Sundays, right? And it was 14,588 <coughs> days. But if you add the extra month, that is, if we go from the 16th day of the first month, for instance, in uh, 1533 B.C. to the 16th day of the first month, in 1493 BC, it's going to be exactly 40 years to the day. So, so we have a symbol here of 40 years in the strong numbers of the Hebrew names Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So it's exactly 40 years on, and I put biblical years. That's why I have by. That refers to biblical years. Um, if it was uh, Julian years or Gregorian years, it would be uh, uh, 40 years and eight days because uh, 14,610 days is 40 uh, Julian or Gregorian years. But with biblical years, they can start and end on different dates um, on our calendar. And so just so that 1,400 14,618 days can represent 40 years. Now, of course, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are going to be thrown into the fiery furnace in chapter 3. Uh, their names are going to be changed. And if you add their names together, uh, the gematria of their uh, Babylonian names in English, in the King James, you get 172, right? So it's now 172 has the digits of... July 7th, or not July, July 21st, right? Uh, so it, it has symbols there. And we know the connection between uh, July 18th and July 21st. That's in Millerite history, those three days. 
and and if we take the strong numbers added together of Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we get 18,008 um, in the strong numbers in Hebrew. That's their Hebrew equivalence of those names. And if you subtract that from 14,618, you get 4,190, which represents April 19th. And uh, you'll see that there's an alternate number that is in uh, the Aramaic, there's just one number difference in the Strong's Dictionary. So in Daniel chapter 1 is written in, in Hebrew. Uh, Daniel chapter 3 is written in Aramaic. So it has a different Hebrew number there in the Strong's. Just they're all one, one different. Uh, another thing about uh, um, Daniel's name, Belteshazzar, is in Hebrew, the strong number is 1095, and in Aramaic, it's 1096. Now, 1095 days is exactly three years. That's just 365 times three. If you have a leap year in there, it'd be 10,096 years to get three years. That's 10,096 days to get three years, right? So you'd have 365 plus 365 plus 366 to get 1096. So <clears throat> I don't know. Did I go through that too fast? Is I mean, I, I spent a bit of time writing this out. So, well, it's the other part of it that's interesting when you're doing the the gematria mm -hmm. of the Aramaic names. Yeah. And you add all of them, including Belteshazzar, together. Yeah. You come up with 315. Yeah. 315 multiplied by 8 gives you the 2520. Oh, okay. Well, and that's interesting. You take a look at the gematry of the Hebrew names, and you come up with 232. Yeah. And... Yeah. If you add to that 545, again, you have a 777. Okay, uh, 545, where are you getting 545, though? I'm just just looking at numbers and in total as to what could come to okay. specific <laughs> symbols that we've been studying. Okay. Yeah, so the 232 is... Uh, is interesting and then you have um the other one's 315 and the 315 for me always stands out <clears throat> because that was my childhood address oh, okay yeah, so yeah so it's one eighth of 2520 correct okay Okay, yeah, so, there's, so it's just kind of interesting looking at the Hebrew numbers, looking at the gematria. There's some interesting details. Uh, all the names add up to 359, uh, maybe relating to the day-year difference. Um, which, what are you saying, which names add up to 350? You mean if you add 187 and 172? No. Okay. Yeah, 359 is that uh, number that Stephen used in his calculation to arrive at November 9th. Um, so that's 360 minus one day for the Day of Atonement. So prophetic year minus taking out the Day of Atonement year, day. Um, yeah, and I haven't looked at their names in in... It, the gematria of Hebrew, the Hebrew letters themselves. But um, so we just have symbols that relate to time, right? We have relating to 40 years and three years. Um, so, and also we have Daniel's Hebrew number 1840, which is significant in its connection to August 11th, 1840. And there was some other. Other calculations I did as well, but I didn't think they were significant enough to to place in there. It's kind of interesting that Mishael and Meshach are only uh, three or four um, 
strong numbers difference, right? 4332, 4335, 4336. So Michelle and Meshach, very um, <clears throat> close together, where vast difference between Shadrach and Hananiah as far as the Hebrew strong numbers. And Abednego and Azariah, they're fairly close as well. But, um, <clears throat> and there's something else that I had done. I can't remember now. Anyway, those, you know, these numbers, they show us that there is connections between um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah that relate to July 18th as a symbol. And, and other symbols here that relate to chronology. <clears throat> so we're going to have uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their names are changed in Daniel 1, verse 7. And, and then they're going to uh, not want to have to be defiled by this food. We know, of course, this represents doctrine. And, and so when we look at this as the first angel's message, how does this story uh, relate to the first angel's message? We think in Millerite history. So the story about them uh, being tested, there's going to be these 10 days in which they're going to uh, show that by eating uh, only pulse and water, that they're going to be superior to those that are eating all this uh, junk food from the king's table. So what does this story represent as far as the first angel's message? Fearing God. Okay, fearing God, yeah. And, and it's also... You know, dealing with, if you look at Millerite history, Miller is going to, um, you know, get his concordance in 1798. That's going to lead to him studying God's word, right? Which is going to be an increase of knowledge. Here, uh, Daniel and his friends are also going to be studying, right? And then they're going to be tested. So there's two different tests here, the 10-day test and the three-year test. And that's why uh, with Daniel, his, um, his uh, uh, Aramaic name, his Chaldean name of um, Belteshazzar being the Hebrew number 1095 represents three years. So it represents the three years that they're tested. And, and so they're going to have, instead of the teachings of Babylon, they're going to be uh, studying God's word, right? So we can see how this relates to the first angel's message. Now, it says in Daniel 1.21 that Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So we know that Daniel's going to live all the way into the first year of King Cyrus. And remember when we looked at Daniel chapter 10 and it says it's in the third year of Cyrus, well, we know that that can't be the same third year. Like that, like that can't be the third year. It has to be the first year, right? So it, it can't be it's the third year that he's from the fall of Babylon, but it would still be the first year of King Cyrus. <clears throat> okay. Now chapter two uh, the importance here, there's lots of importance in order to understand uh, chapter 3. Now, we're all very familiar with chapter 2, but it's in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is after Daniel has been tested, which, which I say happened in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. So it's not going to happen in his second year that Daniel's tested, but it's going to be before the second year. But So in the second year, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And, of course, he can't remember it, right? And um, 
how does this relate to the second message, right? Because we know the first one relates to the first angel's message. Why is this the second angel's message? Because what's what's in this? We know that there's going to be this this image, right? There's the whole story. We're not going to go through the whole story. Um, but Daniel's going to pray to God. God's going to instruct him, and Daniel's going to then give this interpretation, right, of this dream. <clears throat> So when he, he tells him what the dream is, that he's going to see this image with the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, the belly and thigh of brass, and the legs of iron and feet, and his uh, legs of iron and his feet of part iron, part clay. And then a stone's going to come that's made without hands and smite the feet of the image. And, and uh, the iron and the clay you know, the iron and clay feet, and it's going to break into pieces and everything, the iron, the brass, the silver, the gold, are going to become like chaff and they're going to be carried away like, and the wind carried them away, right? Just like it would chaff. And then a great mountain is going to form and fill the whole earth, which is going to be Christ's kingdom, right? So it, it's showing that Babylon is going to fall. Babylon is not going to continue forever. That, right? That's the message to Nebuchadnezzar. That his kingdom is temporary. So does that relate to the second angel's message? I think it connects with it well. <clears throat> yeah, so it, it would be the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. But here in this context, it's just showing that Babylon is not going to be eternal. Now, we know that um, when we look at these kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, but we have this latter part of this kingdom, that is, you're going to have the feet Right. The feet are going to be part of iron, part of clay. They're going to be partly strong and partly broken. And, of course, we know that there's ten toes in, in two feet. Right. So we have that symbol that's connecting us to the ten horns. Um, and we're going to see that in Daniel chapter 7 as well. Um, and in obviously in Revelation 12, 13, and 17. <clears throat> So we have uh, that symbol of 10. Okay. And then um, we know that 10 is a symbol of, of the world. Right. And, of course, this, this mountain that's made without hands, the stone cut out of the mountain made without hands, it grows into a great mountain. That becomes Christ's kingdom. So it's going to bring us to the end of time. Um, but we're going to be given more detail. So this, this prophecy here is a foundational prophecy. You know, have it on the charts. Um, we can see that if you look on like the 1843 chart, you're going to see the feet lining up with, uh, you know, pagan Rome, uh, this diverse beast, and also... Uh, the dragon, and then so there's this idea that when we get to uh, this latter part, this papal Rome, and, uh, and it's going to be like pagan Rome, it's going to be divided into ten. So, so there's a continuation of that. Um, Anything else in this chapter that we need to note before we go to chapter three? Because, you know, I'm not going to do detailed studies on this. I'm just bringing out a few things. It's Daniel chapter three that we really want to look at. Okay, so Angela's just noting that uh, 
3 and chapter 236, dealing with, um, I'm not sure what. God helps us to self-examine. Um, Romans 6.23 shows who's the sinner's only hope. Note the scrambling of 2.36 and 6.23. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so these are going to be important, these, these kingdoms, because we're going to see them in Revelation, and we're going to see them in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to see them in Daniel 8, we're going to see them in Daniel 10, 11, and 12, uh, the, Daniel's last vision, you're going to deal with these kingdoms. And um, back in 2000, I'm trying to think, was it 2017? 2018. Parminder was doing some things with uh, these kingdoms. He was he was creating a parallel between uh, the first four kingdoms and the last four kingdoms. That is the eight, which is a proper way to look at things. That is, we have four, but we know that there there is a repetition. That is, you're going to have seven altogether. And then you're going to have an eighth, which is a three-one combination. And, and we see this grouping of seven as four and three many times throughout Scripture. Um, and then the seventh also has an eighth attached to it. We do that when we draw out the lines. We'll have uh, seven way marks, and then we have the fourth angel arriving. That's going to be the eighth way mark. Um, and we can see how we can group them into, uh, in that case, we'd say three, three, and, and one, you know, three for the first, three for the second. But there's other ways that we group these things. So, so the idea that you have these four kingdoms, but ending with pagan Rome, and then you start again with papal Rome as the fifth, right? United States is the sixth. UN is the seventh, and then you get Papal Rome again as the eighth. That's how we've done it. And so we're going to look at these things. We're going to see how we understood them um, and, and how we should apply them. So they're just, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to address. <clears throat> so we're not, we're not going to address that in detail here at this moment, but we will as we go through these studies, we'll be coming back to Daniel chapter 2. Now, Daniel chapter 3, then, uh, we have Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. So the idea that was introduced in December 25th, 2021, is something we already know. We know this is the Sunday law. Now, what was the reason, uh, what was the insight, I guess, that Colin had regarding Daniel chapter 3 and its connection with Daniel chapter 11. The first few verses of Daniel 11. What is the idea here? Nebuchadnezzar is going to make a statue all of gold. What is that symbolizing? Maybe not everybody picked up on why he used Daniel chapter 3. We know it's the Sunday law, but what is it symbolizing besides just the Sunday law? This golden image. <clears throat> the supremacy of his kingdom. Okay, so so the idea is that it's 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 one kingdom instead of a statue that's just you know these different metals. It's going to be gold all the way through. And so, how did Colin apply that to Daniel chapter eleven? What was he doing in connecting this to Daniel chapter eleven to these first few verses? Wasn't he connecting that to the president of the United States? Okay. Yeah, so he's going to, right, and he's going to have that drawing of the golden image all the way down. 
and he's going to have the presidents of the United States. So he was lining up these kingdoms with the presidents of the United States in some way, right? So when he talked about um, verse 3, so we, we were going along, we're dealing with the fact that Persia parallels the United States. And so we have these kings of Persia, right? There's Cyrus is king. Darius used to be king of Medes. But Darius was the first king of the Persians. Now there's going to be three more, Cambyses, Falsmyrtus, and Darius. And then there's going to be a fourth that's going to be Xerxes. We know Xerxes is Trump. So when he got to verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up, what was his his argument uh, from Daniel chapter 3? Do people understand what the the point that he was making no okay so he would say it's persia all the way through it's all of it is the united states does that make sense no that that's logical okay so so he's just trying to say that this is the United States because Persia is the United States, but he's connecting it to Babylon, right? So Babylon is saying, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, my kingdom is going to be all the way through the whole image. Right. And if we look at, I'm just going to bring it up here. Um, If I can bring this up quickly. Okay. So I just got it, the screenshot of the video here. So. so what he did was he took this. Um, All right, you have the screenshot up or are you going to show it? Thank you. I'm trying to show it. That might work. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, so you can see what he's doing here. Is he's taking, he has this image. Now he's lining up, not exactly directly with the image itself. Whoops. Sorry, the video is moving. I have to do this. Okay. Um, so it's not lining up with the image itself. Right. It's not like saying Ronald Reagan's the head. He just he has this gold image image. And then he did this Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr. But you can see the idea is that we have eight. And and that is we can line up the idea that we have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece and Rome. And then we have. Uh, uh, the papacy. Right. Normally we have. Four, and then we have five. Five are fallen. One is. That's going to be the United States. One that's yet to come is going to be the UN. And then you're going to have the eighth, and that's going to be the papacy. So he, he's sort of lining these things up together. But it's not really clear what he's doing. And there was confusion. When I came into the study, like after it had been going on for quite a while, um, people were having trouble with trying to understand, well, it's the fifth. That is, the papacy is the fifth. It's the one that's going to be receiving the deadly wound. It's going to be the one resurrected. But you're saying the sixth one is the one that's going to be resurrected, right? So that was that was going on when I came into the study. And, and I realized that people didn't really understand what he was doing, right? He wasn't necessarily trying to line these up with those kingdoms and saying there's a direct parallel. But the idea here is that we have this golden image and Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is wanting this kingdom to continue. And in doing so, he's enacting a Sunday law. Right. He's going to 
say that this is the same kingdom all the way through. Now, in some ways, we can see that it is, right? Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome are all these world empires. And but, but when we get to, to the end of this, we get to the eighth. The idea is well, this is the resurrection of the papacy, right? So if we were looking at this as the eight heads, or the seven heads with the eighth, we'd have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome pagan, Rome papal, right? And then we'd have the United States, the UN, and then we'd have the papacy again, right? So you could just put those in those numbers. You can see how they don't line up in the way the, res the different ones being resurrected. But that, that's the basic idea that he's using. Now, um, you can see here, this is, you know, 2021. He's got the COVID-19 mandate lining up with Joe Biden. Now, it's true, the mandates happen there, but there, but the pandemic itself is in the time of Donald Trump, right? Right, it's Trump who's going to to be the president during the pandemic. Correct. And, and we put the pandemic as between Raffia and Paneum. Right? That's where Jeff really placed it. Correct. Okay, so so we can see that there is a Raffian Paneum in the time of Donald Trump. But it's not in the time of Joe Biden, because it's got to be between November 9th, 2019 and January 18th, 2020. Joe Biden doesn't become president, you know, take take his role as president until 2021. So so even though we have the COVID-19 mandate, you know, we, we can't ignore this pandemic part of it. And that's what we kind of saw when we were looking at the story of Esther. Um, so we could see that Donald Trump, Xerxes, is in that third chapter uh, addressing this pandemic, right? He's deceived. Um, so, so there's something here that we need to examine, but we know that this isn't quite right. And the idea of just putting Donald Trump as the eighth, it, it's not understanding Revelation 17 properly. Now, the first thing is we can't just, we know that there's a difference between the first five and the last, well, let's say the first four and the last three in the seven heads, right? Because the first four are all pagan, right? They're the, they're the first four nations. And then, then we have this other part. And we're going to have to study that a bit more. Um, um so Parminder had put some stuff in place that I don't think was uh, correct. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows all about what he was trying to do with the clay. And, and, and I don't even know if I fully understood what he was trying to do. Um, but he was trying to set up for some of his later ideas. And um, Stephen would know more about it, but he's not here. But we're going to try to look back at some of these things that were done and try to figure out why Colin is doing this. But we can see that this idea of the Sunday law is that this is a continuation of Babylon, right? That it's the whole images of gold. And so, so there's something there that we need to be aware of. We can't just, you know, set this aside because we know it's the Sunday law. And in the Sunday law, the entire image is gold. That is, it's Babylon all the way through. But isn't it Babylon all the way through? Hasn't it always been Babylon all the way through? Because at the end, is it not Babylon? Still an idol and an image, so yes. Yeah. So, so Nebuchadnezzar, in creating this image all of gold, he's doing something prophetic. Not that he's aware of. He doesn't really understand what, what he's symbolizing here. Um, and that he's going to enact a Sunday law. That is, he's going to have people have to bow down. And if you're not bowing down, you're going to be thrown in to the fiery furnace that's going to be heated one seven times hotter than it is want to be heated. So we have the word seven times there. 
right? <clears throat> Which of course in that case is not referring to a period of time, though it symbolically can, but it's um, it's it's really literally seven times. And if you want something to be seven times worse, uh, it's an example how you don't just say seven times, you say one seven times, as it says in the Aramaic there. Um, okay. Um, so we can see what Colin was doing. Now, when we look at this chapter itself, Daniel chapter three, um, I always found it a rather uh, laborious chapter to read because it, it's very repetitive. And they always have, you know, he's going to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. Right. And then when he's going to talk about the instruments, it's going to be the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack boot, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. And and they're going to re repeat these things, right? So chapter or verse two and verse three, he's going to repeat princes, governors, captains, judges, etc. And then um, in chapter five and six, he's going to repeat again the instruments, and then he's going to repeat them again in chapter ten. Um, and then he's going to repeat them in chapter fifteen. Um, so why is all this repetition happening? I mean, writing a book, it, you know, they, they try to be as concise as they can. They don't, it's expensive to write out something and, you know, to keep copying it. So why is Daniel writing this out, this vision in this way? Why is it so repetitious? So we got a lot of repetition. Is there any reason for it? Is is this a symbolization of God's mercy toward us? Okay, well, it could be. Um, I'm, I'm not thinking that abstractly. Just, I mean, we have this this repetition of history, right? We have this repetition of these names. Right. Um, you know, because you look at, at, you know, 3 verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. Right. Uh, to come to the de dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And then it says, then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Right? So it's it's very repetitious. It's it's like I don't like they could have written this much shorter. You know, you could. You, what, you don't reason, really, what reason would Daniel have had to have written it in this way? Right. That's the question that I'm asking. I mean, there's not a reason from a literary point of view that I can think of. So, in other words, Nebuchadnezzar gave a decree that all were to come to the dedication, yeah. and all came. Right. And but he's gonna delineate this, right, in this very specific way.
Now, there's a number of things to, to notice. Um, so we're going to have this word set up. So here we have in uh, the Hebrew this 6966 number, right? It's uh, the word kum, right? That's Aramaic word. Um, it, the related word is 6965, kum. I don't know if people recognize this word. Where this comes from. <clears throat> Why would that be important? Well, because we run into this word in other places, in different forms of this word. Right? So, um, if I can find it here quickly. Um, Go to Daniel. So this word here in Daniel 8.11, see this word cash, uh, you have this word. Nope, that's not the right one. Where is it? Um, I'm looking at the, I'm trying to find this one. That's a different word. Um, okay, it's related to the word Macon, but there's, where's the other one? I get the shellac, but there's there's supposed to be a coon here, and I'm trying to remember where that is. Um, I know it's a roundabout way of figuring it out. Um, Okay, so I know it's related to this word, the place of his sanctuary. So there's Makum and Makam, Makam, and um, so these are places. These are like foundations. But I need to find the word. I just don't know where it is. So I can't do that right now. I'm gonna have to figure this out later because it's gonna take me too long to do it. But this word is. Um, in, uh, so let's see. So this word set up is the word kum, and it's, it's part of the name of Jehoiakim, right? So it's related to Jehoiakim, and um, there's something else I can't remember. So I'm going to have to come back to that. But anyway, this word set up, now remember here it says, and the king had set up, and they stood, notice it's going to be the same Hebrew word. So when they stand before the image and the image was set up, it's the same word. So what would be the significance of them that they stand before this thing that is standing? And, and they could have used other word, words. But they stood before the image. So this word, the Chaldee version of it, um, means um, to arise, to stand, uh, to set up, to lift up, to establish, to appoint. Right? And it's related to this the Hebrew word, 
which is basically means the same thing. Right? It can also be related to the word like decree. So they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So what what is being what is being set up? You understand what I'm asking? I'm thinking of what you could be asking. I mean, at this at this point, is this not Nebuchadnezzar setting up his um, vision to be the premier kingdom of the world? Okay. Right. So he's setting up his kingdom. But this idea of setting up, is the idea of standing up. Okay. Right? Um, of arising. So he's setting up this, this image, this, this standing, this image that's standing. And, and you're going to see that when, you know, you have these kingdoms that arise, these beasts that arise in Daniel chapter 7. It's going to be the same... Uh, same Hebrew word or Aramaic word in this case. It's going to be the same Aramaic word. They're going to arise. They're going to stand up. So when when a, a kingdom stands up, what is it doing? I have to apply the standing up as a change of dispensation, but I don't know if that applies here. Well, it's a change of kingdoms. Okay. Right? One kingdom replaces another. When it when it a kingdom rises, it stands up. Okay. It is the same same word. Okay. So, so you're going to have these kingdoms rise up. You know, Babylon is there, then Medo Persia is going to arise or be set up. Right then, Greece is going to be arise. Then this diverse beast is going to arise. Right, you get to like Daniel uh, two thirty nine, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. That word arise is that word set up. Kum. Right, Daniel seven verse five. Behold, another beast, a second like a bear. It shall be raised up again. It's the same word. Right. So so this word is the setting up of a kingdom. Daniel 717. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise or be set up out of the earth. Uh, Daniel 724. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Right. So they shall be set up or stand up and another shall stand up after them and he be, shall be diverse from the first. Right. And he shall subdue three kings. So each of these kings stand up. And so when Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image, it's standing up. Right. It's arising on the plain of Dura. Right. So he's setting up his kingdom. So by setting up this golden image, it's to be establishing a kingdom. And then the people themselves have to stand up. Right? They stand up before the image. Just as the image is set up, they need to be set up. <clears throat> um, I'm going to have to get you more on that word as well. So we have all of this repetition. We have this repetition of this word set up, not just of the image itself, but of the people that worship it. And, and then they're going to respond to this music. So 
why is there music here? What's, what's the point of this music? So you have the image that's set up, you have the music, and, and the word music here in Aramaic is 2170. So that's the 21st of July. It's the symbol for midnight. And it says all kinds of music. The word kinds is 2178. It is all the numbers of July 18, 2020. If you can see the Hebrew numbers there. So what's the point of this music? Uh, okay. We'll stand with, okay, what's that? A call to worship. Right, because it's going to be dealing with worship. And, and we can, we can connect this type of music with what happened, um, when they worship the golden calf. Correct? Right. Okay. So this, so this is a rebellion against God. Um, it's worshiping at the kingdoms of this world. We have the symbols there of midnight. We have the symbols there of July 18, 2020. Um, then we have the fiery, fiery furnace. And it's kind of interesting. Um, they say, shall in the same hour, we have 8160. We can see, uh, and then we have the furnace itself is 861. We have the same digits. Um, all those digits 168 or 186 number of days from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month um, and then it says at that time so you got two one six six so two one six is six times six times six um, and then you have a six there. Um, <clears throat> so you're going to have all this music and the music is going to the, the people that come, it's, rep it's repeated twice. The music is repeated four times. So you're going to have music and mentions all the instruments in the music. The in mention the instruments in the music. And then they do it again in verse 13. And so it's only the, the four times that they have the music mentioned in the chapter, the instruments. <clears throat> okay, and then you have the furnace heated seven times hotter than it would want to be heated. That means that what, what it was designed to do, and of course the men uh, taking them and throwing them into the fiery furnace, they're going to die. And then they're going to take uh, Daniel's three friends here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, throw them into the fiery furnace. Their Hebrew names add up to 187. And then uh, when they're in the furnace, a fourth is going to show up, right, which is Christ. And so then they're going to come out of the fiery furnace and they're not going to be burnt at all, right? Not even the smell of fire is on them, right? And then Nebuchadnezzar is going to bless the gods of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? But he's not really going to be changed at this point. He's going to have to go through his own experience, uh, right? So he's going to enact a law that, you know, Anybody who doesn't worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or does anything against, speaks anything against their gods, he's going to be um, <clears throat> cut in pieces and his houses shall be made a downhill, right? So he doesn't quite get it yet. So this is the story. This is the story of the Sunday Law.
So there's something here that we have to see that's going to connect us to Daniel chapter 11. And, and we'll see this more as we go through um, some of the other things that, that Colin had talked about. <clears throat> so one is, uh, when we look at Daniel chapter 11, if we look at his basic idea, the basic premise here in connecting it, is that this must be Persia all the way through. This must be the United States, which is why he would then connect the actions of Alexander with the United States. That's that's the idea that's that's being presented. <clears throat> now, when I was um, uh, at Colin's study on uh, not this last Sabbath, but the previous Sabbath, um, he had talked about how he he hadn't said that Alexander it represents Trump, or they're not the same symbol, um, at, on December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, but. I've watched the video, and he, he clearly does say that Alexander represents Trump, unless I'm misunderstanding what he's saying. You didn't that... misunderstand it. I did? You did not misunderstand oh, it. Oh, I did not misunderstand it? I went, yeah. I, I went yeah. through his presentations, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that came very, very clear, was yeah. that he, he was giving this, plus there's – one rep one presentation that he does where he not only compares Trump with Alexander, he compares it with Pharaoh, he compares it with, with so many others, and I'm I just couldn't understand the mix of symbols that he was trying to use. Okay. Yeah, so I mean to me it's pretty clear that he he seems to be comparing Alexander to Trump. Now, when I came into the study, he had already addressed that. So that's, he's going to address that near the beginning of the study on December 25th, 2021. When I come into the study, um, I'm asking this question about does he under, does he accept the original interpretation that Alexander is the mighty king, right? And of course, he didn't want to answer it because he thought he had answered it. But, but the thing is, he also, you know, made clear in my understanding that that the mighty king is representing trump now he's saying presently that that's that in comparing uh alexander it's more about the speed of of the sunday law not not a direct correlation between trump as a person so i'm not sure what to make of that except to say that you know that's not what he originally said I don't know how you can go back and say that that wasn't that. But anyway, that's what we have uh, to go on. So, but the idea here is that we know that the Sunday law is represented by Babylon. It's going to be represented by Persia. It's going to be, because that's going to happen in the story of Esther. It's going to be represented by Greece. It's going to be represented by Rome. It's going to actually happen in the time of uh, of Rome that we're going to have the first Sunday law under Constantine. And then it's going to happen again in the time of the papacy. And then it's going to happen again in the time of the United States, right? When the United States connects with the other two parts of Babylon, uh, the dragon power and uh, the beast power, right? The United States being uh, uh, the false prophet. So we're gonna we're gonna have these powers combined at the end of the world, and in each of these histories, each of these kingdoms are are doing things that are symbolizing the Sunday Law. Babylon is going to do it. So if we make this parallel here with Persia, I don't understand how we can say that verse 3 is including Persia. I would agree that Persia 
is is representing the Sunday law just as Babylon is. But you can't include Greece there in verse 3, Alexander, and just say that that's still the United States. That's the argument that he's making is that this is verse 3 is still the United States and verse 4 is still the United States. When he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. This is my understanding that Colin applies this to the United States at the Sunday law. I have no problem applying it to the United States at the Sunday law. I'm just saying that it's not a continuation of verse 1 and 2. When we get to verse 3, it's now Greece. And so we know that Greece is going to typify the Sunday law just as Persia did and just as Babylon had. So we, we still know that there's things we don't understand about this. But the one thing that I wouldn't do is I wouldn't say, because we have this image of gold, uh, that we're just going to say that verse 3 is still the United States. But it is Greece, and Greece does typify events at the end of the world. So when we get to uh, Revelation 17, then, because we still have a lot of work, you know, I'm trying to kind of go over this in just the this broad brush strokes. But when you start to look at the details, there is a way that we can line this up that's going to be similar to what Colin was doing, but it has some differences. And And one of the differences that we would make, so I'm just going to go back here. Okay, so remember, one of the principles that we have is before the cross literal, after the cross spiritual, right? Correct. Okay, and we know that, because um, we're going to have to study this image, Daniel chapter 2 image, in more detail. Um, but we know we have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And, and those are all going to be pagan, right? We're going to have pagan Babylon, pagan, pagan Greece, pagan, or Medo-Persia, pagan Greece, pagan Rome. And they're going to end in that period from 508 to 538. And then we have papal Rome. So we have four world kingdoms. And then we can line Papal Rome up with Babylon, right? Because Papal Rome is spiritual Babylon. Do we agree with that? I see your point. Okay. So, so this is what we've done in the past. And then we can say, well... After Babylon is Medo Persia. The United States is spiritual Persia. Right? It's two horned beast, just as Persia has two horns. Right? So the United States and Persia line up together. And then we line up the UN, right? And then we line up the UN with Greece, right? Greece is the globalist. The UN is the globalist, right? So we line those up. And then we have, so we have seven horns. We can line up if we want to look at it in Revelation 17. In the way that we have done it in the past, Babylon, Medo, Pers Persia, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, all pagan. And then spiritual Babylon, spiritual Medo, Persia, spiritual Greece. And then Rome, in, we're lining, going to line up pagan Rome. With the with the pa with papal Rome, right in the eighth. Okay, so so we're going to look at that, 
and it, and it's and as we start to to look at these structures and look at these things, we'll start to notice know some things that we never noticed before because we have we have more information. We have more ways of looking at these things than we looked at them in the past. So we'll have to try to figure out what this, how this eighth works and operates. Now, the other thing is we know that the pioneers understood these symbols differently. They understood the, the heads differently. So we're going to have to look at the heads. We're going to have to look at them in chapter 12. We're going to have to look at them in chapter 13 and chapter 17. And I don't believe that they're the same in each of the, the beasts. I would argue that they're, the pioneers are correct when they apply it to Revelation chapter 12. That is when they look at the seven forms of government. But I don't think that you can just simply do that in chapter 17. And, and we'll see why when we get there. I mean, I think you can, but I'm saying you can't just do that. So any any final thoughts? I know this is still a little bit scattered because we're trying to pull lots of things together that we have to look at in more detail. So I keep I keep mentioning the things that we don't know yet. But you can see how this is is working out, hopefully. I hope it's helpful. Okay, so so a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so I appreciate everybody who's been here for the study. Uh, but now let's uh, close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are thankful for the time that we've had here. We know, Lord, that there's still so much to learn. And we just ask that we can be faithful in our personal study as we come together each morning, that you can help us to understand the things that we are studying. I pray for each person and their families, uh, that your angels can watch over them, that you can bless them and help them in their decisions and choices. And forgive us for our sins, Lord. Help us to trust fully in you. Bring us together again according to thy word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.